And then she pauses. She said, Mr. Stewart, would you be interested in adopting this baby? Hey, I'm Davey Rothbart, and I host a podcast called Found, where we look at the stories behind lost and found notes, letters, photos, even a found baby. Over the years, Alex Bloomberg and I, we've collaborated on a ton of stories for This American Life. And if you like the great storytelling on Startup, I think you'll really love Found. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Wondery.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Alex Bloomberg, and you're listening to Startup, the podcast miniseries documenting the launching of my podcast company, Meta, I know. It's the business origin story you never actually hear, set down before the facts can fade into this is the garage where it all started mythology, the most honest and transparent account I can make about something that happens every day in this country, but we hardly ever see firsthand, starting a business. You're listening to episode four. If this is the first episode you've heard, you can go back and listen from the beginning. Just to recap, previously on Startup, a trip to California to pitch an investor, Matt Mazio, ended with him pitching me to expand my idea, to include more technology, Podcast listeners, he said, should be able to do with podcasts what they do with articles and photographs and videos online. I want them to be able to message back and forth. I want them to be able to make new friends, create new connections. I wish I could do microtransactions. I wish I could do a crowdfunding campaign. The idea made sense, essentially create the Instagram of audio. But as I told my wife later, that conversation made me feel bad about myself. I'm describing something that feels like the biggest thing I've ever done. And... Like, it seems small to him. It was becoming increasingly clear to my wife, my friends, even my investors, I needed a business partner, which eventually I found, a guy named Matt Lieber. Finding a business partner is very similar to finding a romantic partner, right down to the proposal. If you wanted to come along on this ride, that would be great for me. Matt eventually said yes, which meant that my valueless company with no investors had just doubled in size. All right, here we go. This is the sound of me going back to an investor I've already pitched before, a guy named Micah Rosenblum. At the time of my first pitch, he'd said essentially, I'm intrigued by your idea, but you're not ready to pitch me yet. Come back when you are. So now I'm back with an updated deck, financial models, and Matt, my new business partner. This is Matt. Matt, great to meet you. Great Great to meet you. We sit down and right away things are different. Micah has an associate with him, a guy named Alex Davidoff, and it's more official. They're asking tougher questions than when it was just me bumbling my way through the pitch. I think you're biased given where you come from, but like, I can't tell you the last time I listened to a podcast. Right. I, I, that may be hard to hear, but like, I think I, like, so the question to me is, um, this, the number of people, you know, listening to podcasts is, is relatively small. Millions of people are doing it, but not tens of millions. And we're more ready with answers. Actually, well, 40 million people are doing it right now in America. I believe that's quite small. 40 million Americans are downloading podcasts? Oh, listening, yes, listening to podcasts. Hmm. This is from the Edison research. One thing that comes up during this meeting is something that Matt and I have talked about a lot, what we've come to call the platform versus no platform question. That is, do we embrace the strategy laid out by Matt Mazio, the investor in California, try and become the Instagram of audio? Or do we just concentrate on creating our shows and distribute it through the existing channels, iTunes and Stitcher, whatever? Micah Rosenblum's opinion was very different than Matt Mazio's in California. I think it's hard to do both. I actually, I, I, this is a silly analogy, but it's like hard to be a hotel and kayak. Like, I, I think you got to decide what you are because it's going to prove to be much harder to do whatever you decide to do. And producing, if you're a studio, like, that's what you should get really good at. So in other words, he's saying, you guys are content guys, not tech guys. So stick with what you know. But even though Micah didn't think we should build a tech platform, there were things he felt that were missing from our pitch, specifically details on how exactly we planned to grow our audience and how valuable that audience was. There were two terms that he and Alex used, customer acquisition cost, which is basically how much money do you have to spend in advertising to attract each new listener, and lifetime customer value. How much money can you make off of each customer over the period that they're using your product? And they wanted to know, what do our numbers look like? How much would it cost us to acquire listeners? You guys listening right now, how much would we have to spend to bring in more of you? And how much revenue can we generate from you? How many of you will purchase premium subscriptions or special products that we end up selling? How much will advertisers pay to reach you? Micah and Alex, they wanted more than theories. They wanted answers. Nailing a, a acquisition model, I, I think that's really important to us. Um, Everything you say, I totally believe. 
Except there's a, there's the there's kind of the slightly cynical side of me that says it isn't new. Like the idea of audio, you know, podcasts have been around a while. Why haven't they taken off? And I, I think you need a a better answer for that. Like the more it feels like I'm just going to do a good job, like the less compelling it is, right? Because it's like, well, everybody thinks they can do a good job. Where are you leaning right now? I, I mean. <clears throat> So I think it's diff- I mean I think it's difficult to to think of this as a venture scale business based on what you guys have said. For me to think about this as a venture scale, hundred million dollar plus opportunity, I'd want to see that acquisition model kind of churning, proven out a little bit. Like cost this much, you know, produce a show. X percent of shows are hits. There's this much value to a listener. These are the strategies to acquire listeners, and the blended acquisition cost is X, and more or less I know what that looks like, and here's how we scale it um, in order for me to you know, participate, if we want to participate, I guess. So you're leaning no? Well, I, I think so. This no was almost poignant coming from Alex, because unlike Micah, Alex did listen to podcasts, was a fan actually admitted he was a little starstruck to be meeting us. He said he would definitely sign up to listen to the shows we made. He was on board with the vision, but to invest, he needed more math. For every assertion we made that we're on the verge of a second golden age of audio, he needed a chart showing blended customer acquisition costs. And the reason he wanted these numbers, to use Micah's term, it de-risked our proposal. And the first time I heard Micah use that term, de-risk, I was a bit confused. After all, the whole point of being a venture capitalist is to take risks, big risks, that other people aren't willing to take. But if you know that the vast majority of your bets will fail, that there's no certainty about a huge blockbuster outcome, what you can do is at least try to have certainty about a possible path to that blockbuster outcome. In other words, a credible theory of hugeness. That's what they're looking for. A tech platform, that's one credible theory. A mathematical model showing exponential audience growth, that's another theory. And a theory like that, we just weren't able to provide. Coming up, our fortunes start to change and a warning from Shel Silverstein. But first, a word from our sponsors. This episode of Startup is brought to you by the airline Virgin Atlantic. Everyone at Virgin Atlantic believes business is an adventure. And it's their job to make it exciting and comfortable. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I've got the best job. That's Mark Murphy, and he has a pretty strong case. Mark is the food and beverage manager globally for Virgin Atlantic's airport clubhouses, which means he gets to fly around the world tasting different foods and cuisines, scoping out the trendiest bars, and curating it all to make Virgin Atlantic lounges from New York City to Hong Kong stack up against the world's best restaurants and bars. Business meet adventure. Although, if you just want something familiar... They got you covered there too. We had a, a regular passenger with us who would come into our Heathrow lounge and he would order a bagel. And we never had bagels, and the staff would go to the terminal and, and go and buy him one and bring it to him in the lounge. So I got wind of this and, and we developed a dish called George's Bagel. Um, we put on the menu so that next time he came in, you know, I, I think the uh, whooping and the hollering was uh, quite loud. I'm assuming he, this guy's name was George. Yeah, yeah I think so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. Virgin Atlantic. They work hard to make business an adventure you won't forget. Go to virginatlantic.com to learn more. Startup is sponsored by Squarespace. With Squarespace, you don't need to know code or be a developer to have your own beautiful and professional-looking website. That's because Squarespace has really smart developers who create tools that you can use to make your own website. People like Cole Krumholtz, who's the engineering lead for the developer platform at Squarespace. And Cole loves his job. He's a natural at it. He's been doing it since he was a kid. Anytime that you get to build something with software, it's both creative and imaginative. Pretty early on, it was a it was a way that I could sort of make fun of my brother in a pretty effective way. I wrote this little program and I told my brother to sit down and to use it. And the program asked him, what's your name and what's your favorite color and a couple of other simple things. And then no matter what answers he wrote in, it would at the end sort of evaluate his personality and tell him something like, you're a dork. Um, which which was much more effective than me calling him a dork. To have the computer tell him that he was a dork was a new and difficult thing for him to grapple with. Squarespace. 
making it so you don't have to be an engineering whiz kid to torment your little brother. Anyone can do it now. And make it beautiful, too. Right now, use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. That's squarespace.com, offer code STARTUP to get 10% off. Want me to... <laughs> Samir, Samir, look what daddy has. Why are you crying? <laughs> I believe I've mentioned before in this podcast that I have two kids and I'm starting a business. Matt is in the same boat. And so we're both very familiar with the idea of risk. But risk looks different depending on who's assessing it. For investors like Micah Rosenblum, one risk to him investing in our company is moderate success. Let's say our company grows steadily, not exponentially. Not enough for us to sell the company for hundreds of millions of dollars to some massive media company like Disney or Yahoo. So success for me and Matt, a profitable growing company, is actually a risk for Micah. And by the same token, success to Micah, massive exponential growth, that actually feels risky to me, specifically to my family. It's something I think about a lot. Check it. <clears throat> Check one, two. Check one, two. It's uh, 5.30 in the morning on Sunday morning. Everybody else is sleeping, so I'm sort of whispering. This happens maybe a couple mornings a week lately. I wake up and my mind is racing. I'm with all these worries and anxieties about how the hell this whole thing is going to work. Um, yesterday morning, I was the, I was up with the kids, and they they were sitting on my lap and started reading the Giving Tree, and that fucking book, holy shit! I hadn't read it since I was a kid, and I started reading it, and it's like, it's about this tree that loves this boy, and the boy and the tree play together for a long time, but then the boy starts to grow up and doesn't come and see the tree very often, but every time the boy comes back, the tree quivers with joy, and the boy is like discontented in his life and needs money, and so the tree gives the boy all the apples and says, sell the apples and get the money, and then the boy comes back later, and he's like, I need, I need a house, and so the tree gives the boy its limbs to build the house and then the boy comes back later and each time the boy comes back he's older and older and older so he comes back as like this late middle-aged guy and, and clearly his family has fallen apart and the tree's really excited when this late middle-aged guy comes back and quivers again with joy uh, and says come and swing on my branches and play with me like you used to and he's like I can't play I need to get away I need a boat and so the tree says, I, I, I can't give you a boat, but I have my trunk. Cut down my trunk, and you can build a boat out of my trunk. So he chops down the trunk and then hauls it away. And so then the tree's just this little stump. It's just like every, it's just such a horrible metaphor for like being a parent and like sort of like loving these kids so much and in the beginning they love you and then they move on and you're excited about it but you're also lonely and then that the little boy's life didn't seem to work out that well and that's your terror that's your terror for your kids that they're going to grow up and not be happy and i don't know it's just like there was something i started bawling in the middle of reading it like just crying and then i'm on these blogs VCs and VC culture and Silicon Valley culture, and they're all talking this, you know, passion. They talk about passion. Like there's this guy who was saying, you know, the person who epitomizes passion is, you know, so-and-so, the founder of Salesforce.com. So-and-so lived, breathed, and ate Salesforce.com 24-7, always working late, devoted his life to it at the expense of everything else. And I'm like... I can't do that. I don't want to do that. Like, I'm already crying at the giving tree about this time passing and my kids moving on and, like... Ugh. I'm scared about that. Back on the street after that Micah Rosenblum meeting, Matt and I debriefed for a little bit. They had said no, and yes, that stung a little bit. 
But Mike had actually been very encouraging. He'd even offered to introduce us to other investors. I think Michael was quite transparent. Like, he basically loves you. He loves the people involved. He's excited by the project. He doesn't, when he puts it next to other venture investments, it's not as clear a, like, boffo return. Uh One way of hearing what they're saying is sort of like, you guys should raise this money and do this business. You just don't want to raise it from us because we have a definite expectation of what we're of what we want back, right? And then if and then and then if we are their kind of expectation, then we go back to them and we're in a much better we're in a much stronger position. Yeah. No, it's true. In other words, what Michael was telling us, there are lots of investors in the sea. And not all of them need the prospect of hundred X returns. And these investors they can be anywhere. I just, I want to go back to college and live in a college town and go and open a truck and sell t-shirts. I mean, it's like sort of like what I'd like to do in my next career as, as I retire from commodity trading. This is a guy named Mike Trocki. He's actually an old friend of mine from long ago. There were a group of us who lived in Chicago post-college. This was in the 90s. We all pursued various paths. Some of us went into teaching, others opened coffee shops. I went into public radio. Mike, after flirting with a career in the Foreign Service, went to work at the Chicago Board of Trade. Two decades later, his net worth looks a lot different than the rest of ours. And he and a bunch of his colleagues have started a small investment fund. I reached out to him and he said, sure, come out to Chicago, make your pitch. And Matt and I, we're an odd fit with these guys. Usually Mike and his partners, all old friends that he's traded with for years, invest in financial technology, new trading platforms, that sort of thing. In fact, not too long after launching into our pitch, Matt and I started seeing some confused looks it becomes clear we have to start from an even more basic place than we've been starting in other pitches. Podcasts, what they are is they are, they are digital audio files that you download from typically straight to your, either to your computer and then to your phone or straight to your phone now. So Are they always recorded or are they ever broadcast live? Broadcast or, or the by nature recorded because it's, recorded. A, it's a, fi- a discrete file that you download. But everyone in the group was familiar with radio, both public radio and other examples of broadcasting excellence, namely Howard Stern. Mike himself wasn't a fan, but this guy on his team, George, he listens to Stern every day. We bonded over it. I happen to believe that Howard Stern is like a genius at content creation. He's, he is like, he's doing many of the same things that we do at This American Life. Puts exactly. out, I never yeah. listened to him, but I always thought it was just a porn show. I mean, he uses different tricks. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, but like, he's a genius he, at it, basically. But, no, but, but it, taking it, one, one idea and doing it in many variations, basically. Well, I mean, well, you, you're a listener. Well, Why do you listen to it? I listen to it because he's a good interviewer. Uh-huh. And I think everyone that he brings on there, he gets them to say things that they would never say to, I don't know, Barbara Walters or whoever they, you know, the Today are Show. They, are the same people going on Barbara Walters yeah, as they usually, Stern, they usually really? start at Howard Stern in the morning and yeah. go to, like, Good Morning America. Wow. And they're dropping F-bombs with Howard, and then they're on Good Morning America, and they're like... Yeah. You know, halo around their head. And, and that is the, by the way, that's what's so great about podcasting is the same thing that Howard Stern has grown into, like whatever it is, $500 million contract with, yeah. with Sirius. It's like that intimacy. Like yeah. you're, you're there with him. You're having this really intimate conversation with him and the listeners like respond to it. Of all the pitch meetings we've done, this one felt the most natural. A lot of joke cracking, talking over each other. We ran them through the numbers, the ad rates, the listener subscriptions. They asked smart questions. And then we got to the end. Okay. Yeah, so one question though, before we go. If you were leaning, if you had to place your odds, in or out, what are, what are your odds? Oh, I think in. Yeah, I think in, you know. I mean, I'd have to, I, I, I got to understand it more and I've got to, you know, look at some of the financials and all of the way that it is. But I mean, I, I love the idea. I think it's great. Awesome. You know, I mean, it's also, a, you know, it's a little bit of a, it seems kind of fun. <laughs> I think it's fun. I, think I always like to have fun in business. I never seem to have enough fun. <laughs> Investing in something because you want a little profit and the chance to have some fun, that's sort of the opposite of looking for a 100x return. And we started to find that every investor we talked to was different and doing it for different reasons. In one meeting, two investing partners poured over our financial projections, interrogating every number. How did you arrive at this figure in month six for office space costs? But then there was this other investor meeting when we got to the slide in our pitch deck where we outlined our theory of where our revenue will come from. The investor waved his hand dismissively and said, I don't care how you guys make money. I assume you'll figure it out. I just want to see user growth. Slowly, gradually, we began to get to some yeses for all different reasons. A former financial guy who'd been the first person ever to explain to me what a toxic asset was back when I was doing a lot of financial crisis reporting, 
He invested 50 grand because he was a fan, basically. And he thought there was a solid enough business here that it was worth placing a bet on. There was a media innovation fund that invested for something of a mission reason. Perhaps our business could provide a revenue model for other forms of journalism out there. And then there was Andrew Mason, the founder and former CEO of Groupon. The first thing that I want to do is I want to tell the story of how you and I met. Because I think it was a very unlikely series of events of what you chose to do that sort of intersected with my world. I don't think we would have met had you not chosen this as your... This, that's, yeah. that's likely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think our paths would have crossed. Right. Okay, so the story. Andrew Mason made hundreds of millions of dollars from Groupon, the fastest growing company in history. And a year and a half ago, he took some of that money to start a new company called Detour, a location-based audio platform, guided tours that you listen to through your phone that adapt to where you are. He had a guy to build the technology, but he needed someone to help him create the content for the tours, someone who knew about narrative and telling stories for the ear. In other words, he suddenly had a demand for a set of skills that I possessed, skills that until that moment hadn't had much application outside of the insular and unlucrative world of public radio. He reached out to me and I told him his project sounded awesome, but I had my own project I wanted to start, a line of vegan pet snacks. Just kidding. This, my podcast network, this is the project I wanted to start. And eventually he agreed to invest, $100,000. And like we were finding with everyone else, his reasons were almost entirely his own and not very much about money at all. The reason that I invested in you was for a couple of reasons. Okay. It wasn't to make money. All right. One is like purely um, exploitative. Like I just want, I just want you close to me for my for the purpose of my own business, right? Because I can learn things from you, and you can introduce me to people, and et cetera, et cetera. So right. this is like an investment in my own business. Um, but but the other the other reason was like you're you're good at what you do, and um, and I'm a believer in investing in people. What do you think is going to happen with your money that you gave me? The, what do you think the return is going to be? Are you expecting a return? How, what, you, what is your, like, how are you viewing that money now? So this is the first time that I've thought about that. <laughs> you asking it right now. Um, I think... So clearly you didn't make this thinking like, oh, this is going to make me a big return. Like this was not, that was not the primary reason for investing. No. Like, well, here's, here's, I, I think there's probably a higher likelihood than average that you will be able to generate a profitable business and a lower likelihood than average that it's going to be, you know, a hundred, a hundred, that has the potential to be a hundred Xer. Mm -hmm. The only question I have about whether or not you're, I, I feel like if you're not successful, it's going to be because you didn't want it enough. And there's a lot of good reasons that you might not want it enough. Uh -huh. Like, I have a kid now, mm -hmm. and I'm worse at running a startup because of that. <laughs> right. I mean, it's hard. It's hard. It's it's an insane amount of work, and balancing that with um, with not just having a family, but but having but like fulfilling your responsibilities to that family if you choose to do that is I don't understand how anyone could do that without making trade-offs. I think the people that tell you that, oh, it just forces you to be more thoughtful about how you manage your time mm -hmm. are really, that's a story that they're telling themselves. Right. I mean, what are they going to say? No, I'm worse at my job. Mm -hmm. I'm worse at my job. <laughs> There's yeah. no question about it. I have literally told people, oh, it just forces you to be more thoughtful about how you manage your time. And every time I say it, I know in my bones, I'm the same old horrible time manager I was before my kids were born. And yet, despite Andrew's real talk, he is starting his own company, and he's investing in mine. Even with all the arguments against it, we're both placing the same bet. We're on the street in Manhattan. We're about to enter a Chase Bank on the corner of 7th Avenue and 27th Street. Let's go in. Here we go. No. Getting out your card? Yeah. Oh. What does it say on that card? It says Matthew Lieber, American Podcasting Corporation. Uh, uh, what's our pin? Personal. That's my personal pin. So should we do a check the account balance? Let's do it. <laughs> $385,000.
$385,000 is more than Matt and I have ever had in a checking account with our names attached to it. But it's still nowhere near enough. We are planning to launch three shows, each with hosts and producers and travel budgets. We need to pay salaries, healthcare costs. We need to pay for office space. We're going to need a million and a half dollars to give us enough cushion for 18 months of what they call runway. In short, we still have a ways to go. Uh, yeah, cool. It's awesome. It's a start. It's a start. Coming up, scenes from the next episode of Startup. But first, another word from our sponsors. Coming up on the next episode of Startup, we try and come up with a new name for the company. Inspiration can strike at any moment. Let's see. It's uh, 3.34 in the morning. Um, and uh, I think I came up with a name. Um... Yeah, it didn't sound as good the next morning. That's coming up on the next episode of Startup. To subscribe to the podcast or get on our mailing list, go to our website, hearstartup.com, H-E-A-R startup.com. Our website was designed in partnership with Athletics. We are paying them, but not enough. So let me give a plug. They were amazing to work with. Fast, professional, excellent. Check out their work, hearstartup.com, H-E-A-R startup.com. There, you can find out everything you need to know about the music we used on today's show. Special thanks to Mark Phillips, who mixed today's episode and wrote and performed our theme song, and to Build Buildings, who wrote and performed our special ad music. If you're into Twitter, you can follow me, at Abex Lumberg, and also follow our show, at Podcast Startup. I'm Alex Bloomberg. Talk to you soon on the next episode of Startup. Thanks to our sponsor, Virgin Atlantic, business is an adventure and everyone at Virgin Atlantic works hard to make it one you won't forget. Go to virginatlantic.com to learn more. Special thanks to our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to build a beautiful website, portfolio, or online store. Remember to use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace, build it beautiful.